Director Ray, you are now recognized for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about the FBI's work leading up to and following the siege here at the Capitol on January 6th. It's been more than five months since the violence and destruction of that day, and I'm no less appalled today than I was then and no less determined to do our part to make sure that it never happens again. On January 6th, our country witnessed an angry mob attack the U.S. Capitol in a failed attempt to interfere with our democratic process, an assault where you, the members of Congress, were victims, but where all Americans, in a sense, were victimized, and more than 100 law enforcement officers were injured in just a few hours. Such acts of domestic terrorism are an affront to the rule of law and have no place in our democracy. And the FBI's agents, analysts, and professionals, alongside our partners, have been working around the clock to track down those who participated in the attack to hold them accountable. We've already made close to 500 arrests, with more sure to come. Unfortunately, January 6th wasn't an isolated event. Domestic terrorism has been and continues to be a top concern for the FBI, so much so that over the past three years, we doubled our domestic terrorism investigations and arrests, in no small part because of the rise in racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, which I elevated to our highest threat priority level back in 2019, and because of the rise in violence from anti-government, anti-authority actors over the past year, including on January 6th. I've also repeatedly highlighted the severity of the threat more than a dozen times in testimony over the years since I took office. Now, thankfully, the FBI is far from alone in this fight. Earlier today, Attorney General Garland announced the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. The strategy calls for a sweeping response to the pervasive domestic terrorism problem, one that demands attention from all of us. It serves as a commitment from the U.S. government to work with our state, local, and foreign partners, and with private sector partners to share domestic terrorism-related information, prevent domestic terrorism recruitment and mobilization to violence, and disrupt terrorist activity here in the homeland before it happens. It's also a thoughtful response that carefully balances American safety and security with the civil rights and civil liberties we all cherish. And before I take your questions, I do want to talk for just a moment about an issue that was front and center during the riots on January 6th and that also hits very close to home at the Bureau. Over the past year, we've seen a troubling uptick in violence against members of the law enforcement community. That's not just counting the Capitol attack on January 6th or the attacks against hundreds of officers across the country during the civil unrest last summer. We're also seeing it, tragically, in the number of line of duty deaths. In just the first five months of 2021, 37 officers have been murdered on the job, far surpassing the number from this time last year. I put that in perspective, that's almost two law enforcement officers violently killed every week. And that's not counting all those officers who died in the line of duty facing the countless other inherent dangers of the job like from a car accident in pursuit after a subject or drowning during an attempted rescue, or even the scores of officers who died from COVID-19 because of course law enforcement kept coming to work every day despite the pandemic. Nor is it counting all those officers who've been badly, badly injured on duty and thankfully survived, but whose lives and whose families' lives are forever changed as a result. Now, the loss of any agent or officer is heartbreaking for their families, for their agencies, and for the communities they serve. We in the FBI know that all too well with the terrible loss of Special Agents Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alfin, who were shot and killed down near Miami just this past February. Since I came on board as director, I've made it a point to know when any officer is shot and killed in the line of duty anywhere in the United States. I read about their career and about their family before personally calling the chief 
or sheriff of their department to offer mine and the FBI's condolences and support. Since August of 2017, when I started in this job, I've made more than 200 of those calls. Now with each one, I think about the family members, friends and colleagues rocked by the loss of a loved one, the careers cut short and the communities hurting. And I bring this up today because if we're not careful, we could find ourselves taking for granted the sacrifices law enforcement officers and agents make every day to keep all of us safe. It takes a pretty special person to get up in the morning and be willing to put his or her life on the line for a total stranger. And to do that every day, year after year after year for an entire career is extraordinary. So we owe a debt of gratitude and a heck of a lot of respect to the brave men and women who choose to protect and serve their fellow Americans. People like the Capitol Police and Metro PD officers who bravely defended you and this building on January 6th. And especially those who've made the ultimate sacrifice like Dan Alphen and Lauren Schwarzenberger, whose memories we honor every day through our work, along with the countless others we as a nation have lost throughout the years. All of us, all of us here today have a shared responsibility to take a stand, to protect our communities, to support those who serve in law enforcement and to condemn violence regardless of its motivation. And we in the FBI are ready to use all the tools at our disposal to do just that, to uphold the rule of law and to fulfill our mission to protect every American. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today and for your continued support of the FBI. I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you for your testimony. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech, Today, did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out? How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah.
Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6 is uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.